welcome to the book launch for Daniela Lai's book, Socioeconomic Justice, uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. Um, the book launch event is co-sponsored by the Gender Institute and the Center for International Security at Royal Holloway. And we are pleased to launch this excellent book. Uh, sad that the launch has been delayed a little bit by uh, the COVID pandemic, but happy to be able to do it and happy to be able to have people here virtually from all over the world. I will briefly introduce the book and then briefly introduce the uh, participants one by one as they present. And then we'll allow each participant some time to speak. And after allowing them some time to speak, we'll allow Daniela some time to comment and then engagement with all the participants and the audience. The book, book is called Socioeconomic Justice, International Intervention and Transition in Post-War Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, it addresses the question of how uh, socioeconomic justice belongs within transitional justice and explores socioeconomic violence in war and how it plays a role in justice claims after wars, uh, examining the role of international actors uh, that rely on narrow approaches to transitional justice, ignoring socioeconomic justice, and looking at the link between justice and political economy in international interventions and in Bosnia's post-war and post-socialist transformation. Our first presenter um, is Professor Eric Gordy, who is Professor of Political and Cultural Sociology at the University of College London. Um, and he, he has worked on and continues to work on questions of culture, power, nationalism, and the staying power of preconceived ethnic categories uh, and the ways in which uh, that plays out in the Southeast European region. Um, so I'm not going to give a very long introduction, but I'm going to turn over the floor to Eric to make his comments. Okay. Hello, everyone, and uh, um, and congratulations, Daniela. Um, this is, uh, I mean, it's a great moment, not just because it's an exciting book, but because, uh, um, but because it's always just such a happy occasion when we're able to celebrate the success of our former students. Um, so this is fantastic, and and it, it's it's such an honor to be on this panel of many of my favorite people. Uh, let me uh, let me say a little bit about uh, about this theme that uh, that Daniela is uh, I mean really one of the leading people in the generation of opening it up and that is uh, um, socioeconomic justice in post-conflict environments um, because one thing that is really striking is that since I mean if we if we mark the beginning of uh, um, of war related justice claims with uh, um, with the founding of the Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in in 1993, there has not been a lot of attention. I mean, either in Bosnia and Herzegovina, elsewhere in the region, or elsewhere in the world, to to the economic and and social dimensions of transitional justice. And really, most of the work that um, that you've seen is very recent. We're talking about uh, about the last three or four years. Um, and if you look at the people who are producing this work, I mean, people like Daniela, but also uh, um, Slajana Lazic, uh, Jesse Hraneshova, Maria O'Reilly, um, you'll notice interestingly that all of them are are women, and um, and I think that this is not coincidental um, because uh, um, because issues that are of particular concern as they uh, as they relate to gender are involved with uh, highlighting this intersection between the economic and the social and other forms of uh, um, of violence related justice now um, there are a couple of terms that get used often in all of these discussions about uh, post-conflict justice 
One of them is transitional justice. Another one is reconciliation. I mean, those of us who have done research in the field are all going to immediately recognize that you use these terms among members of the publics in uh, in the regions where uh, um, where where violence is a recent experience. They hate these terms. They hate the term reconciliation. They hate the term transitional justice. And you'll hear claims. I mean, there are people um, who are actively hostile to uh, um, to the idea of transitional justice into the project, not because they're supporters of criminals, but uh, um, but what they argue is that transitional justice is a neoliberal project. And this claim seems like a jarring claim at first when you first encounter it until you think about the term. And if you think about all of the other conceptual items that fill this basket of transition, right? Um, privatization, shrinkage of the state sector, um, what's also visible in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where Daniela's research is concentrated, is a promotion of ethnifying elites who hold monopolistic control over public property that is enforced through informal networks. And it seems as though the post-conflict justice efforts, in a sense, um, I mean, either contribute to it or strengthen it or fail to contest it. How do they do this? Well, look, one of the basic principles of criminal prosecutions, if we think about post-conflict justice as being centered around criminal prosecution, is this principle of the individualization of guilt. That is the claim that uh, um, that we do not attribute guilt to, uh, um, to ethnic groups or to collectives, but to the individuals who, uh, um, who carried out organized or commanded crimes. This is a legal principle, and it's a legal principle that is intended to rhetorically reduce Reduce the uh, um, the prominence of ethnic affiliation in understanding crime, but it comes with at least two problems. One is by saying that guilt is being individualized, right? Using the verb form there, um, it is made individual. Um, then really this principle of individualization of guilt shares the basic assumption as collective guilt about the ethnic character of crime. They say it's ethnic crime, but we're going to individualize it for uh, for procedural purposes. And the second thing that it does is by concentrating on the moment of commission of crimes and the people involved in crimes, it avoids the uh, issue of structural and institutional causes of violence. Um, and uh, there are probably some additional effects. I mean, one thing that uh, that I would mention is that the concentration on criminal prosecution, the emphasis on accused and convicted criminals through trials, um, has, uh, has a couple of negative effects. One is that it draws attention away from the victims of violence and the needs of victims of violence and draws it instead toward the criminal. And in doing that, it turns the criminals into some form of celebrity, right? You know, the criminal is being put on trial, but because the criminal is being put on trial, they also get their own TV show and uh, um, and are in the news and have their portraits flown as banners of football matches and uh, um, and and so on. And it turns them into, it invests them with the power of being markers of identity. Um, so one of the unintended effects of individualization of guilt and concentration on the criminal aspect of crime is that fetishism displaces solidarity. Now, there is something interesting about this because pretty much every post-conflict and post-regime truth commission um, has published a report with a set of recommendations. Pretty much all of those recommendations have included at least some proposal for material compensation of victims. And in some cases, they have included um, proposals for redistributive measures, saying that uh, um, that social inequality and discrimination were among the root causes of violence. And none of those recommendations have ever been implemented. Um, so it's clear that the interest of states is... Uh, is on the side of this, and that is why I think, you know, by opening this question, that uh, Daniela Lai has really done us um, a, a service um, because she opens up for us two quick key questions. The first question is, 
what do we think would address the most important causes and consequences of violence? Right, something on the procedural and legal level or something on the social and economic level. But more importantly, what do we think would constitute a good society with the prospect for um, for building peace? Um, so I, I think I'll end with that by by thanking Daniela for opening these these very large and, and very important questions. And and congratulations again, Daniela. This is super. Thank you, Eric. Okay, now I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Katarina Kuzik, who is a visiting scholar at the Department of International Politics at Aberystwyth University, co-convener of the BISA Southeast Europe Working Group, and the communications officer for the Journal of International Relations and Development. Um, her work is based in IR and located in the Balkans, but interdisciplinary and interested in international interventions as experienced by youth and agricultural producers in Serbia. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Katrina now. Um, thank you, Laura. So first of all, congratulations, Daniela. I know I've said this many, many times, but it's really a wonderful book and I think will be read for a long time and, and very widely. And I'm so happy that um, I got to read it. And also thank you for inviting me to this panel. Um, I have to admit I was a bit intimidated to be with all these scholars that I admire so much. Uh, so thank you for that as well. So I, I think I came to the book a bit perhaps a bit differently because I actually don't really study transitional justice or processes of reconciliation. Um, the point that Eric said, I do notice how people dislike them, but I never, never really engage with them conceptually or empirically. So what the book really did for me and the, the reason why I enjoyed it so much is that it really spoke to these limitations that I also grapple with myself the limitations of calling a person, a place, or a people uh, post-war or post-conflict. And kind of what do those labels hide? Um, and what do they kind of remove from analysis? And not only what are the empirical consequences of that, so what we miss, but also what are the analytical consequences of such, um, of such moves? And I think what Daniela's book, Daniela's book gives us, it gives us alternative categories of analysis, and it gives us conceptual frameworks that allow us to approach societies that experienced war beyond these limiting categories of post-conflict um, or post-war framings. Now, I want to, um, can I have a couple of questions that um, I'd like kind of maybe to discuss also uh, jointly. But before that, I just want to focus on two small things that I particularly enjoyed about the books. And one is how communities in Piedra and Zenica were engaged and approached. Um, in the book, and I think in Daniela's work um, in general. And reading the book, um, I kind of found different levels on which I enjoyed this engagement. So the first one was really in kind of um, the practical methods. And I really love that the book has this appendix in which you tell us like, so this is how it actually looks like. And I think this is so important, not only in producing kind of scholarly works that we know how arguments are made, but also in teaching. And, you know, as um, you know, I wish I had, I had read this as a PhD student that a, that the book has an appendix like this is what I did when I traveled. Um, so like where 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 in Bosnia and Herzegovina to go, who to talk to, uh, basically telling us that these details like practical methodological details matter. And I really appreciate this. The second point that's very related is the kind of meta methodological impact of these kinds of choices. And I think the book. And I really like that it does this very silently and implicitly talks to, I think, this larger project within IR, within politics, within social sciences, that is not only realizing that the knowledge that we produce, have produced for many, many years come from a specific place, even though it travels as universal and that we need to provincialize these knowledges, but also engages in reconstruction and kind of now producing knowledge from a different point of view. And I think the book does this without kind of making these big claims that um, are quite popular and does it so silently and so well. And I think it really does that with the concept of justice, saying kind of how, do we, how can we know justice differently from these seemingly universal ideas if you spoke to these particular communities. Now, I also uh, kind of in this, um, in this kind of engagement with communities, what I also found very striking is that the book also kind of shared its aims with the activists that it spoke to. And I think in very, again, not in kind of presumptions, points of, of, of saying, um, 
I am becoming an activist, or maybe you did become an activist, and that's also great. But but kind of in saying, I think the book opens with a quote saying from the plenum saying we fight exclusively for an order based on social justice, and I think it illustrates the, this urge to overcome this ethnicized politics, and the book actually overcomes ethnicized conceptions of justice, and I think in that you so wonderfully align with the people that um, you work with that I think it's impressive and inspiring and more probably most importantly really useful for both activists and scholars to come. Uh, now the second thing that I really enjoyed in the book and that I think also implicitly in the book is how Daniela deals with her own positionality as a researcher in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And again, we don't have these like long chapters of unreflexivity, but it just it's everywhere and it's very it's done very beautifully. Um, and I think what um, uh, again, it's on, on the first kind of level, it's done in a very practical way. So Daniela says, I think this is also in the appendix, the way that you are perceived and your your position in relation to this international intervention is going to shape not only who you talk to, but also what these people tell you and how they perceive you. And this actually impacts the material that you have. But I think analytically, um, the book accomplishes an incredibly important task of highlighting that we as researchers do not only um, study these things, but that we also construct them as problems in the first place. So in other words, um, if, there is a, if there is an idea of transitional justice that is devoid of socioeconomic issues, it was also us, a very broad us as researchers that contributed to this state of affairs. And I think the, the book deals with this wonderfully when Daniela says that interventions is something that she performed as well as she studied and then launches um, kind of a critique of the way that Bosnia as a case was constructed um, through particular research that focused on, on very particular cases. And I think this is done both from an, an ethical dimension, but also methodological dimension of like what is missing from this overrepresentation of particular cases. Um, and I think this is quite a radical thing to grapple with, because I think in this field of kind of broad international intervention, we're very used to critiquing other people and not often grappling with the fact that other people is also us and that we participate act actively in this construction of this scholarship and the construction of the objects that, that we criticize. Um, I also had just a couple questions that I wanted to pose if, if, if we have time for a discussion. So the first kind of question that I really um, was left with from the, from the rich empirical discussion that, that was presented in the book, um, I wondered what the what the books, even though the book focuses specifically on traditional justice, I wondered what do the processes examined say to the more general critiques of international interventions as these neoliberal and always depoliticizing projects. And here I mean both on kind of maybe even like IR classics in international intervention that that critique it, but also in the more new like more detailed uh, regional scholarship that has always that that has a long tradition of criticizing the professionalization of civil society and this separation between civil society and grassroots and kind of the depoliticization that's involved in the professionalization of civil society. Um, and the second uh, question that I had was about the protests uh, uh, in 2014 specifically, and especially kind of about the complexities of the protest. Um, can they be interpreted as a sort of austerity from below, given the kind of the public sector resentment that we see, not in only these protests, but I think in protests in the region more general, generally, there is always this um, kind of feeling of antagonism with the public sector and the, and kind of almost calls for austerity coming from the public that I always find quite fascinating. Um, and the last question that I had uh, was on a very particular thing and I really enjoy that the book goes into kind of the particularities of the mining and steel industries and the pollution and the labor that they are entangled with. And I think here the empirical and, uh, material taps into a new direction of research in Southeast Europe that sees Southeast Europe as, an, as a site of extraction, both of labor and of natural resources. And I was wondering how might these demands for labor that are so prominent in not, not only Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also the region, sit alongside environmental efforts? Because I think there is, also, there is often this um, tension, and I think some of the uh, material in the book can be productively kind of 
um, maybe redirected into these new discussions that are emerging. Um, but thank you so much. And again, such a pleasure to read and discuss. Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, next is Zoran Vukovac, who is a, a researcher at Justus Liebig University in Glessen in sociology, working on labor history, memory, and post-socialism. I'll turn the floor over to you, Zoran. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Daniela, to this amazing uh, event. Um, it's so nice to see some of these people whom I haven't seen in a while. Um, um, it's just really like, as Katrina mentioned, I, I was a bit like, oh, am I, e am I even like, you know, um, grown, grown enough, grown up enough to like be a part of this? Uh, but it was, it was so fun reading your book, Daniela, and congratulations again for, for uh, just doing this research and, and also for inviting me also to discuss it since, um, um, for me, this was really important as, as I was on both sides of this process. I was um, um, a practitioner on the ground um, in the aftermath of 2014 protests. I was, um, especially through uh, um, a Banya Luka Social Center, which I with other people organized and, and ran for, for a while. Uh, but also, on the other hand, as, as a researcher, having done fieldwork in Triedo, partly also in uh, Zenjko Dobojski Canton, um, so for me, it, I, I know it's always difficult to to look beyond this uh, retributive justice and uh, its legitimacy in communities which are affected the most, uh, Bosniaks and Croats in Kredor, Serbs and Croats maybe to an extent in Zenica. Um, also, it's it's for me, it was always difficult to talk about like uh, um, um, things that kind of like put it aside uh, to like use um, um, Eric Gordy's um, um, uh, here construction, like basically fetishism displaces solidarity. And we um, um, immediately after the protest, we kind of started working with this, uh, uh, on this idea of bringing social justice into transitional justice claims. Um, and I mean, like for Triedor ICTY has an extensive archive of the scope of the violence, uh, and, and a number of indictments, uh, which is over 50, I think, really speaks for itself. Uh, but for these communities, um, uh, in terms of rights and political representation, but also in terms of jobs and opportunities, this, this uh, uh, was never a successful process. So um, they're kind of still bound to what we know as, as the date and framework and what it uh, prescribes. But the way you work here with Fraser to treat the question of justice as multi-dimensional concept, uh, where wartime violence and genocide is not diminished, but uh, the ways in which ameliorating injustice actually is expanded, it's like super interesting for me having had this experience on the ground. Um, and if we're talking about the impact, I think people on the ground have been ready for this paradigm shift for a very long time. It's, it's, it wasn't just the, the peak moment in the protest, but it was like basically, you know, building up towards this moment for, for a very long time. And this is, I mean, <clears throat> they acutely understand the injustice built into the system itself, although they don't always have the means to articulate as, as you've probably seen. And I think your data pretty much shows. Uh, but if you, if you look at it, I mean, uh, um, we have um, in Priedor, uh, again, I'm, I'm talking about Priedor because this, this was so interesting for me. I'm also working on like labor histories and also like this memory uh, struggles, which are pretty much tied into the transitional mechanism, uh, TJ mechanisms. So for me, um, even though TJ has done a lot of work in Priedor, we have a number of bad guys behind the bars, um, definitely not all of them. Uh, in the city, this housing crisis has been kind of solved and, and rebuilt, mostly not exclusively through international intervention as well. Uh, but still we see, uh, um, and, and I remember it here of, of an article in Failed Architecture about Kozarets, which is one of the neighborhoods in Priedor, um, uh, in the municipality, it's saying how these rebuilt houses are pretty much like uh, beautiful on the outside, but empty on the inside. Like they're not furnished, uh, uh, but they have a state-of-the-art surveillance system uh, systems at them. So in in a way, we see how TJ works. You know, it 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 kind of like 
you know, the, the framework is there. Everything is said, but it's uh, in the on the inside. It's like the the sort of livelihoods uh, are lost, and the culture, the local culture, is lost as well. Um, um, as as I mentioned previously, uh, opportunities for jobs uh, and life opportunities as well were lost for for many of these people. And and when I say like many of, of the, the people who returned, uh, I also I also think of of communities of, of um, Croatian Serbs that moved to the region after the, 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 the uh, war in, in Croatia. So they also kind of suffer a, um, a level of violence that it has not been addressed. And there are also like their uh, pot potential for them to grow in these communities is also diminished. So like the war here masked many injustices, but I think you've done a great move focusing on, on local justice claims and set them against this um, analysis of like political economy war of international interventions, but also the welfare state mechanisms that always favor warriors over uh, uh, victims. So, I mean, for me and, and many others, I think uh, um, protests were a game changer with uh, numerous local initiatives taking up the issue of social justice. Uh, on their agenda, expanding uh, in, on questions of privatization, on questions of en environment and memory. So, it, and I, I, I mostly got introduced to the theoretical side of your argument here in the wake of the protest with, with Svetlana Dimovic's edited volume that's called like Two Faces of Social Justice or something. Um, uh, but then they kind of like all of this theoretical uh, um, um, musings got sidelined with the with the protests themselves as, as they were uh, kind of like the sports to be reckoned with. Uh, protest inspired like a lot of us, not only in Basok, but who, in which we organized according the lines of like social justice, historical revisionism and feminism. But you, you've probably also seen uh, a number of NGOs also dealing within civil society sector, dealing with this in, in Zenica and, and Priedor. And, and your, your appendix really speaks to this amazingly. Uh, but, but having worked in such an environment, it's difficult to see how feasible this is. Like I, I remember reading your your book and I, I pulled this out as, as it was funny. You quote Fraser saying that remedying socioeconomic injustice entails uh, quote redistributing income, reorganizing division of labor, subject uh, subjecting investment to democratic decision making, uh, uh, transforming other basic economic structures. And of course, I agree here. Uh, but if we look back at the protests themselves, they formulated similar claims. But uh, <clears throat> But you can just remember the high representative Valentin Insko like uh, responding to this, and you know he probably sent tanks at Nancy Fraser for endangering uh, uh, Austrian banks, and and I mean like this is using framework would would uh, make you probably an accomplice here, so like it would be a proper standoff in this situation. So what what I want to say here is is that. Uh, it's it's obviously it's it's an amazing uh, sort of like uh, paradigm shift, uh, but it's hardly possible to move beyond this framework without changing the paradigm on international stage, which you like absolutely amazingly recognizing this. So like maybe the other point that I I, I want to make here as well is is this decentering uh, the focus on identity, and I think this is this is something that has pushed me uh, into doing a PhD after a break uh, um, and, and after uh, being a part of, of the scene uh, locally. And I, I struggled a long time with this, with this, with basically with reality of concentration camps, uh, having grown up in, in a very much denialist culture in which sil silence always means impunity. Uh, but you, you kind of here elegantly show how this silence has its roots in, in political economy of loot and plunder. And, and for me, it's possible to talk about here uh, about the reality of post-socialism without neglecting wartime violence. This is the, the important message that you show. Um, and, and also like it reminded me of like many discussions we had at Basok and, and especially words of Noah Treister, who's like been a, for me a, a brilliant thinker uh, and a practitioner as well. And, and, and she said like, you, like with, with our research, we have to kind of like uh, um, background uh, 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 somehow camp experience because like every time we start with the camp, well, kind of like this is all that we're gonna get in our in our uh, um, analysis. In other words, Noah reminded me so many times that war ushered an identitarian framework that guides uh, about research and politics. Something Katarina mentioned as well. Like we construct the object of 
of our research. And, and this is pretty much like the way it's a, it has been done since 95 onwards. And even before that, it's this focus on ethnic identity that has like blurred so much of, of the social reality on the ground. And, and by focusing on, on these, uh, um, the kind of like uh, claims from below, the justice claims from below, we can also like more easily find language to address other injustices. So um, maybe I should I should um, just finish it here. But um, uh, uh, what I really kind of appreciate uh, um, is is um, you may be commenting on on the fact that um, there's still much work to be done in terms of tying uh, um, justice claims to alternative histories of, of, uh, um, of post-war and post-socialist Bosnia. And, and, and I'm thinking here mostly of, of the ways uh, local communities, uh, refugee communities, returnees, uh, and other people, but also I've, I've been thinking of inmates a lot, like concentration camps pretty much figure uh, uh, prominently in, in all of Bo Bosnian politics. But I remember having done also work on, on, uh, um, on this population that um, they are structurally obstructed, like their claims to justice have been mostly uh, sidelined by, by the state itself. Like the state kind of like, along with the international community, the state has been built in such a way to like basically block any access to, to its own institutions. And, and re it reminded me of a, of a comment in, in, uh, in uh, one of the books, um, uh, what's it called? Um, the uh, to, 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 I, I totally forgot the, the title. It's basically uh, um, it, it's a, it's a it's a community from from France, like a um, anarchist anarchist uh, um, uh, community, which which produced like this uh, several books, and one one was called uh, uh, to our friends. Uh, and I and I love the comment that they made. In, in Bosnia, there were so many claims. There's proliferation of claims uh, um, after 2016 protests, but there's nobody to f fulfill these claims because, like, um, the the institutions were emptied out of power a long time ago, and it never came back. So I, I, I've been thinking in in terms of like agenda setting, and in terms of so many uh, uh, claims, is there actually something that we could done, like open up this avenue uh, uh, that would change the paradigm? Uh, of, of like different uh, research being done, like expanding research on on uh, how communities were were hit most in in post-war and and, and post-socialist Bosnia, and and how would you how would you expand your uh, your framework uh, to um, um, other basically marginalized communities? Um, I I know this is like one of these broad questions, but but I think like as, as I mentioned earlier, I've been thinking about. Uh, Croatian refugees in Bosnia. I've been also thinking about migrants, how how people uh, got very much saturated on, and and completely exhausted by by their claims that that they're trying to make, and now they're silently leaving. So, um, um how about how can we bring this kind of like uh, uh, justice paradigm to people who are abandoning the space, who are emptying it out, so to speak, so, and and we're only left with the institutions, you know, like. Thank you so much again. Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, we are grateful for your comments. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Catherine Baker, who's a senior lecturer in 20th century history at the University of Hull, a specialist in post-Cold War history, international relations, and cultural studies, including the post-Yugoslav region in a transnational and global context. Her projects are connected by an overarching interest in the politics of representing, narrating, and knowing about the past. Uh, so I'm going to turn the floor over to Catherine now. Daniela, first of all, congratulations. And I can't wait to be able to, you know, think of these thoughts of yours at book length as well. So, you know, I'm in this position midway down the line up. We've all been facing this key question of yours. Does socioeconomic justice belong within transitional justice? And, you know, now that we've heard so much about why the way you frame and research that question is so important, being in this position on the panel, I thought maybe I can add an extra frame and say, you know, one of the very first things your work has done for mine is it's made me ask what does socioeconomic justice also have to do with peace building? In fact, it's been doing that since, you know, at least 2015. And, you know, a year after the plenums, 
we were at a BISA workshop, which Yelena obradovich Rodnik and I had organised to start theorising the nexus between peace building and transitional justice, what we both felt was there. Um, and Daniele, you were raising these important questions of socioeconomic justice and, you know, sparking conversations that then helped set the agenda for much of how, you know, particularly our South East Stewart working group, in BISA became a platform for investigating those entanglements. And for those who don't know, Daniela and I were both co-conveners of that working group, along with Maria Adriana Diana and Natalie Martin. We could not have organised that programme without Daniela's motivation and leadership, which I'm incredibly thankful for. And, you know, the working group now, of course, is in the very capable hands of Katerina and colleagues. Now, as well as all of that, Daniela's contributions have helped me put a connection between socioeconomic justice and peace into words in the sense that if socioeconomic justice isn't delivered, there's less likely to be peace. We saw in the years before the Yugoslav wars that economic insecurity and in particular, the dashing away of everyday aspirations people had used to feel secure about in the context of a federation of ethno-territorial units created the circumstances where people like Milosevic could ramp up ethno-nationalist polarisation with the, the consequences that we all know now. In my work at the time, you know, just before we'd had that workshop, I've been interviewing Bosnians who had worked as locally recruited interpreters for the UN and NATO peace missions at various times between the UNFPA war period during the war and right up to the late 2000s. They were a generation who had seen the hopes for peace and reconstruction in the late 1990s when most of them were younger adults, still had some hope of a reform to the Dayton system after the Budmir process at the Sadich Finchy verdict in 2009, if the political will was going to be there to implement it. And 11 or 12 years later, they've now seen yet another decade of their adult lives go past in what Step Janssen, Vanita Lobicic and Chana Berkovic so vividly call the waiting room. They're still waiting for reforms that will open up politics and the economy. In the meantime, some have voted with their feet in civic protest, like the plenum protests which frame this book. Some have taken advantage of the opportunity to move abroad, for instance, to Germany, and exchange professional aspirations and the intimacy of home for a chance for better socioeconomic life. And, you know, here your work feels like it aligns with someone like Daniela Vastorovich's, who sees both of those responses as kind of linked, affective responses to how Beha has kept on being peripheralized in the European political economy. And, you know, sometimes both those responses are even taken by the same people. What you add here is to underline just how deeply this is a matter of injustice and growing injustice, since, as you argue, it's the economic reforms would have been imposed on Beha and acquiesced to by elites who stand to profit from them, which stop communities pursuing their own socioeconomic justice claims. Now, there's an important point that you make for the kind of scholarly agenda setting that's gone on around all of this. Um, and, you know, I'll quote a bit of this because you put it so well. Social justice is not the kind of justice we usually associate with transitional countries, but that was precisely what the protests were about to citizens and activists. This did not mean divorcing Bosnia's post-war condition from their claims. Instead, it meant forging, or rather making explicit, a different kind of link between wartime violence and post-war justice claims. Now, you know, researchers like me can theorise about how a kind of narratives that ex-interpreters, for instance, were retelling with me about the precarity of work of the international intervention forces demonstrated that we needed to see the socioeconomic collapse and the peace and security consequences of the conflict was really deeply entangled. That kind of double lens of post-socialist and post-conflict perspectives that Janssen and other anthropologists in the new Bosnian mosaic collection were calling for and then I tried to take up and, you know, all of that. But, you know, here are protesters living it and theorising it from their situated knowledge. So what are some more of the contributions this book makes now that you have the chance to deepen this argument at book length, which it has really, really deserved? One is how it affirms that socioeconomic injustice accompanied and in fact preceded inter-ethnic violence and war crimes. Since we're talking about practicalities and teaching, I'll say that when I've been teaching history modules about the Yugoslav wars, although you, you could do this equally well in an international relations classroom, one of the documents I often use with students is an extract from Dr. Minka Cechaj's testimony in the Stakic case about Theodore. 
where she's remembering how non-Serbs and indeed even some Serbs who opposed to the SDS were dismissed from their posts at Theodore Hospital through the list one of your interviewees remembered being posted on the hospital door. And, you know, I asked students then to suggest why SDS would have done this as part of taking over the town. Meanwhile, the VRS was seizing the industrial facilities and turning them into prison camps. And then there's a different kind of violence inflicted on Beha's industrial economy. The international intervention forces during and after the conflict were turning factories into bases rather than back into workplaces and sites of production. So many of the bases my interviewees talked about when they were narrating experiences of translation and interpreting British forces in I-4 and S-4, for instance, were factories. There was a Banu Luka metal factory, the Makonyaj Glad shoe factory, and so on. Nobody was processing metal or making shoes or doing anything economic as long as those forces were there and their employees were presumably still being kept on waiting lists. This then exacerbated the consequences of the violence done to the fabric of their economy during the war. So, you know, the, the way in which, you know, you want to have students as well as researchers to, you know, to see the, these contexts for your work is important. Another important contribution you're making is articulating the connection between Theodore and Zenitsa, which we've already talked about a bit, and, you know, which we've almost been disciplined not to see. It refuses that separation between the RS and Federation as frames that post dayton politics tend to impose on us. As you almost kind of matter-of-factly point out halfway through the book, Theodore was the main extractive site for the iron ore that went to Zenitz's steel mill by, by rail. And, you know, this is the heart of the context. Workers from the two sites were even holidaying at the same seaside hotel that the two enterprises had built in Nail. So these two sites were connected economically before they were ever separated ethno-politically. <coughs> as a comparison slash contrast of how they've experienced post-war economic decline and deindustrialization. So, you know, we could even extend, I think, a question that Katerina was starting to pose. What happens if we study the conflict and its consequences and, you know, indeed the society from the vantage point of the resource, say? rather than the vantage point of the ethno-political territorial unit. Now, third contribution I, I could face here is the way that you're historicizing transitional justices linked to liberal democracy as the reason why liberal concepts of democratization, legalism and individualism are seen as so central to the process. It doesn't have to be. It can be reimagined differently, you're suggesting, just as Bear has civic protesters are asking to reimagine the constitutional settlement differently. So, you know, that's, again, potentially something else we can develop. A fourth thing that really stands out to me about this book is actually its way of foregrounding genealogies of scholarship. You know, we can see that just in the acknowledgements, the way that you're talking about how, you know, how our work and how our interpretations unfold. This entire line of panellists, you know, here with us right now is, you know, kind of a genealogy in itself. I can see that on a, on a personal note as well, you know, reading the section on political economy in late Yugoslav Bosnia and, you know, seeing how ideas of the synthesis that, you know, I was trying to make have, you know, helped to, you know, help support your thinking there. Your reflexivity on how we build our interpretations is another important contribution of yours. And Again, for those who don't know, Danielle has got an excellent book chapter coming out on language knowledge and research in the post-Yugoslav region in a volume called Research in Yugoslavia and its Aftermath, which is out very soon. And I wish that I'd read that as a PhD student. Importantly as well, your book affirms there is no tension between the empirical and the critical. And, you know, I think these two things often get forced into a, a false opposition. We need the facts about atrocities in Theodore to make sense of the justice claims that are being made there. And indeed, this book is an exemplar of how to make socioeconomic critique while affirming the evidence that ethnic cleansing and genocide did take place and that the genocidal expansionist project of the SDS cannot be compared to the war effort of the Bosnian government. So, so like everyone else, I've got a couple of questions to, to leave you with. And, you know, the first one is, you know, why is it, do you think, that the former Yugoslav region has been so absent from debates on the socioeconomic dimension of transitional justice in general? This was a state socialist system that was undermined during the events that led up to the war, and even more so during its socioeconomic remnants undermined during the war itself. So, you know, the space for imagining any kind of socialist alternative to the broken and Titoist system was shut down through those processes. 
That might seem like it should put the post-Yugoslav region at the forefront of those debates, and yet it hasn't happened. The second question, again, is following on from some of what we said about methodology and positionality. And, you know, it's to ask, you know, since you talk in, you know, you're talking in the preface about how, you know, your, your journey towards this has started out in Sardinia. And, you know, what perspective then might thinking from a location that started out in Sardinia might have given you on the conjunction of injustices that Bosnians are facing today? Thank you very much again, and congratulations once more on an incredible book. Thank you. And last but not least, we uh, have Michael Pugh, uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of Bradford, uh, who so research interests include critical theory and globalization, maritime governance, and peacekeeping and Migration by Boat, Humanitarianism, International Political Economy, War Economies and Transformation, including Labor Markets, UN Security Rules, Peacekeeping, Intervention and Peacebuilding, and Southeast Europe. Thank you for being here, Michael, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much indeed, and it's a great privilege to be amongst such uh, well-known experts in the field. Um, I'm uh particularly impressed by Danielle's book because she makes those case studies come alive and also she um, brilliantly uh, links those case studies to the broader picture uh, and that's one of the things that I want to talk about uh, today um, my own interest in the region came about because I studied the first elections in uh, BIH after the war, the local elections. And I then became acutely aware of the need for people uh, to find some means of survival. And so I became in interested in this issue. How do people survive in those kinds of circumstances? Um, and in many cases, it was women who were doing uh, most of the activity of surviving. Um, and I then became interested in how people got by in terms of work, if they could find it. So um, there are things like Stele and Weser, ways of making connections locally that um, reinvigorate, uh, in many cases, the previous connections, pre-war connections, in order to get by, in order to get facilities, in order to get uh, help. Um, and then in terms of labor, uh, there was the issue of um, so-called uh, illicit uh, employment um, and people were joining political parties in order to get a job, for example. Uh, and that made me think about criminality. Uh, what, uh, especially um, the early academics and the international community that was involved regarded as criminal was a means of getting by for so many people uh, and that i think meant that we were constructing uh, a notion of justice that confused justice with criminality um, let me uh, focus on two particular issues uh, one is the division of labor, which has already been mentioned, um, because I think there is more research potential on that particular issue, um, especially if you consider it within the um, European context. Because I have this question, what role does Southeast Europe now play in the European division of labor? 
and hence in the region's socio-economic uh, injustices. We know that the successor states have specific, if not unique, social uh, relations, as did Yugoslavia. Uh, and Yugoslavia was well integrated with uh, the European economy and beyond. Um, the focus has always been on the trade and the services that Yugoslavia performed, but also thanks uh, largely by uh, to Susan Woodward, um, also the export of labour, um, which uh, by the time of the oil crises meant that uh, much of that labour had to return um, with skills that they brought with them. Um, and those movements, those sorts of movements continued uh, under force, of course, during the war, but also after the conflict, um, as the internationals and indeed the locals uh, had uh, a determination to move away from uh, so-called peripherality and become further integrated into Europe. Now, you can argue that there's been quite clearly a sweep of neoliberal transition and deregulation of finance capital that's plunged many Europeans into precarity or precariousness. Uh, one can speculate uh, probably fruitlessly as to whether or not the war made much difference to this kind of precarity occurring. As we've heard from Catherine, this precarity was existing before the war broke out. But it is worth, I think, investigating evidence of how the political economies of foreign direct investment, uh, which Zenitsa is a, a brilliant example, a shocking example, um, the political economies of chain supplying with limited value added on site and the exports of primary produce and of course the export of labour. What impacts have these had on uh, socio-economic uh, injustice? And I thought of two really interesting examples that would be well worth uh, researching. <laughs> One is the exodus of women who uh, are now working in German care homes and in German hospitals. What impact does that have on the families back home if they can't take them with them? Uh, and what does that have uh, culturally? What sort of impact does that also have? Um, so it's women who have, in a sense, uh, a gross simplification, but have replaced men who used to go to the car factories in, in Germany and Austria. Um, and the other example is the example of precarious freelancers in Southeast Europe um, working in the field of uh, digitalization who are exploited by foreign companies uh, because they're much cheaper than, than elsewhere. Uh, and they don't have any um, social protection, uh, not from their own governments and not from obviously the foreign uh, companies. Uh, and there's currently an issue about what sort of tax they should pay. Uh, and many of the governments in Southeast uh, Europe don't actually understand the concept of freelancing. So that's one issue that I think uh, could be productive in uh, furthering this book's um, introduction to um, many of these issues. 
um, to do with survival uh, and particularly the division of labour. Incidentally, one of the things that I'm sure several of you would have encountered in Zenica is the concern with the environment and the concern with health, that the appalling pollution that the company which took over the uh, steelworks um, have managed to um, get away with. Um, uh, one also has to recognise there was enormous uh, pollution there in um, former Yugoslavia. Um, but the externals were supposedly bringing in FDI to modernise things. Um, and to help with the integration into the global economy. Um, and the health issue, I think, is another field in which um, much more research needs to be done. Uh, how has um, this region coped or not coped with the current pandemic, for example, would be an interesting issue. Now, the second point that I uh, thought to raise was um, this issue which Daniela deals with also very, very well, is um, resistance. Uh, the concept of resistance has undergone, undergone, I think, some kind of transformation in uh, the labelling um, because it's almost become um, under the neoliberal agenda, it's almost become um, equated with resilience, which goes back to what Eric was saying about individualization. Individuals are resilient. Uh, solidarity is um, not considered significant. Um, and I think, um, of course, um, Resistance is associated with social deprivation in in transitions, which Polanyi back in the 1940s also uh, dealt with. Um, and um, more recently, Pierre Bourdieu in his book on acts of resistance um, made um, a plea for um, resistance that was um, coherent and political and focused on well-being. And that's the basis of uh, my current question, is what is happening in the region to broaden resistance into a political force that tackles the structural and systemic injustices that are going on. Uh, we know that uh, in BIH, for example, there were a, a numerous pop-up protests uh, on everything from neglect of agriculture to pollution in Zenica to the ID uh, issue for children. Um, and currently protests by freelancers in Skopje about the tax um, um, issue affecting them. Um, but these target uh, specifics, quite reasonably, bottom-up protests, and they tend to be uh, quite local in many cases. Um, is there something going on which is going to be much more structural, which is tackling systemics, which in fact opens the door once again to the kind of socialist um, solidarity that existed, um, not perfectly obviously, um, in former Yugoslavia? Who is addressing this issue? Um, and I think what Daniela does is point to the concept of plenums, which is not a concept that's particularly familiar in Western Europe, for example. Um, uh, and it was associated more particularly with Eastern Europe, I think. And 
that does uh, have some prospect for development on a broader front. There is also um, a particular organization called Engaged Dem uh, Democracy Initiative, EDI, um, that is um, trying to organize this um, broadening and addressing, uh, if you like, in a sense, um, Bourdieu's um, a call for um, a much broader approach to um, well-being. Um, but there are uh, enormous difficulties in this kind of project because of the complicity that the multitude has in tax avoidance for corporations, uh, in, um, in um, individualizing uh, performances rather than engaging in uh, solidarity activities. Um, and um, much of the resistance has, of course, occurred on the far right in Western Europe, at least, um, pushing mainstream politics further right. Um, so I'm kind of hopeful that this um, uh, move towards uh, plenums and the move towards EDI is going to capture uh, the need for coherence and produce uh, broader manifestos. Um, but it has to be done in a situation where the nature of work has changed, the nature of labor has changed, the division of labor has changed. Um, I nevertheless think that there is uh, plenty of scope um, for uh, further research on this issue, research which Daniela has uh, brilliantly opened up. Congratulations, and uh, Daniela, well done. Um, and uh, it's a book that's uh, right next to me here. <laughs> All the best. Thank you, Thank you. Professor Pugh. Uh, and now I'm going to turn the floor over to Daniela if she wants to address anything that has uh, been discussed. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, which I'm assuming is nobody, uh, but I will also give the introduction anyway. Dr. Daniela Lai is a lecturer in international relations in the Department of Politics, International Relations and Philosophy at Royal Holloway University of London and the author of the book that we are celebrating the launch of today. So Daniela, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you all so much for the very kind words about the book. I don't think I was ready to hear all of the nice things that you had to say about me and my research, uh, but I really, really appreciate it. I am, um, I really do, especially because all of your work has a, really played a major role in um, in my research and my yeah, and everything I've learned from from all of you over the past years. So, um, so I'm not sure I can really do justice to all of your comments and questions in the time I have, but I will try maybe to address some of the points that you've raised and see if um, anyone else also has any other comments or questions, uh, leave a bit of time for that. Um, so the first point maybe I'll address uh, is the one around the socioeconomic justice and transitional justice that Eric mentioned at the start and Catherine also uh, asked about at the end. Um, and Eric, you're completely right in pointing out that not only this literature on the socioeconomic aspect of transitional justice is new, but also that a lot of the people who have been writing about it and who are writing about it now, like Slajana, or uh, Maria and, and so on, um, are women. And not only that, I think that one of the maybe reasons for that is that um, a lot of this literature also owes um, much to feminist theories and feminist approaches to an understanding of violence and justice and uh, also feminist political economy. And that these kind of theoretical frameworks have made it more possible to engage in this kind of work. 
Um, but it is also the case that it doesn't that this in a lot of this literature has not dealt with with these exceptions with the former Yugoslavia and this is not just in terms of socioeconomic justice the way I talk about it in the book now that I'm also doing a little bit more research into the role of corporate actors specifically in um, conflict affected contexts and post conflict um, justice processes especially. Um, this is even probably even more recent. There has been a wave of interest into corporate responsibility in transitional justice, and the absence of the former Yugoslav region from that literature is even more striking. Uh, a lot of this um, looks at other regions, you know, and this I, I can understand to some extent um, why, because I think um, conversations around socioeconomic issues have been uh, more explicit and prominent in some countries, for example, in Latin America than they have been in the former Yugoslavia. But at the same time, it's, it does surprise me, as Catherine says, that given the experience of Yugoslav socialism and the transition, that this is not really at the center of any uh, major academic conversation at the moment. Um, in part, I do think that it is maybe because of post-socialism or because of socialism that this is the case, that there is a reluctance to um, relate socioeconomic issues to socialism because socialism is seen as, a, um, in a way, just like in, the, in, in these international interventions, as something that belongs to the past and something that we don't necessarily learn that much from in terms of how to deal with uh, the consequences of war or justice issues. And I think that's something the lit that this scholarship on the former Yugoslav region could potentially challenge and add a lot more nuance into how we discuss socialism and post-socialism and transition. So the former Yugoslav context may be seen as a um, not like or it's generally in this kind of literature when it is mentioned is sometimes represented as too the transitions are too complex they are too messy to be dealt with within this kind of approaches uh, which is very problematic of course um, and the so the other point I wanted to um, maybe address uh, was around this question of the environment that both Katarina and um, and Mike mentioned in their comments, which I think is really is really important and something that definitely I, had, uh, I knew of clearly going into doing fieldwork in Zenica, but I had not realized how important it would be when um, before I actually talked to uh, interviewees in Zenica. Uh, but it really, really um, plays such a major role. And something that is not, again, necessarily linked to the war and that is not linked to justice issues. Once again, they're very much kept um, separate. Um, and I I mean, to me, there are a few things that I think are quite interesting about this, is that these environmental issues in the region have become a lot more, like they are very serious and we know that there is a huge problem with respect to uh, pollution and air quality, not only in Bosnia and in the cities that I write about and Zenita is like the very, the very dramatic case of this, uh, but in other countries in the former Yugoslavia as well. Um, and this has been become even a more major problem, despite the fact that during the post-war transition, we have we've had all of this restructuring of industrial conglomerates that in many cases have led to just the industrialization and the shutting down of these big industries. And one might think, oh, you know, if the region is deindustrializing, then this would mean that this pollution would go away. And that is clearly not the case. And it is not the case, not only because of the behavior of some firms like the steel mill owners in Zenica and the uh, mines in Priador that we know uh, that I write about in the book, but also I think because of a lack of um, investment in technologies more generally and infrastructure that could have helped address the other sources of this air pollution as well that have has not happened. Um, and then at the same time, there is also this um, thing, this tendency that I um, to kind of frame uh, claims for jobs and labor rights in opposition to environmental 
and health um, rights. Whereas I think historically, these two things have always been very strongly connected. And whenever we have seen mobilization of workers, um, the workers have never just gone you know, on strikes or social mobili mobilization just to get more work, but also for safer working conditions and workplaces and for them, uh, for their community. And so I don't think, you know, historically, it's quite curious that the, we uh, then end up seeing all of this framing as oppositional, as a sort of trade-off, whereas historically, these have always been, it's always been the case. Um, and the third issue that I find quite interesting with respect to this question of the environment is, is one of, again, accountability, because not only is accountability from, say, the government of, or international organizations missing when it comes to addressing these legacies of socioeconomic violence, but accountability and the loss of uh, participation in political and economic de decision making is something that definitely plays a role in this um, issue, environmental questions as well. Um, because even though this was definitely, um, it's, it's more likely that the problems with participation in decision making in Bosnia are again framed with respect to political issues and institutions of Dayton, which again are part of the problem, but definitely not limited to that. And the lack of participation in economic decision making and the lack of accountability of private of the private sector is also um, a, an issue. And the two things are related. Um, then with respect to my research and the protest, I mean, um, I would say maybe just a quick note on my approach to doing the research, which I I very much appreciate how like Katarina has uh, described it and how Zoran has also talked about it. I mean, how, how all of you have made this kind of references. Um, and I just want to really say again that reading and engaging with you and your work, all of you, has made a huge difference in that respect. And the BISA working group especially, I think, has been such a wonderful place for me to meet people. And I remember that workshop on soci on transitional justice and peace building that Catherine and Yelena organized uh, um, in 2015, I think it was, right? Something like that. And that was also the first time I met Catherine and I was uh, so excited because I had read all of her <laughs> work and I, I couldn't wait to meet her. Um, but it's really, I think, also helped me approach in the way I approached the fieldwork and the research that I did. Um, and also in this question of how I approached the research in a way that, um, as Catalina said, I try to uh, center the um, work and the mobilization of protesters and how it's in a way aligned with the claims of the protesters. And this is not necessarily, as she mentioned, the question of me being uh, an activist or necessarily being an activist in that context. But I think part of a commitment to a kind of research that it helps overcome the conditions that gave rise to the need for me to do that research in the first place. Um, and that is, I think, what motivated it. It doesn't necessarily mean being really an active participant in activist movements, but a way a way to use research to kind of further those kind of uh, emancipatory goals. Um, and and this clearly influenced the way I approach the protest. And I mean, this question of the protest is people have asked me questions about the protest for many from many different points of view including like whether I am being too optimistic or naive about the potential of social mobilization in when I write about it. Um, and, and I think maybe what I really liked about your comments was Eric's comment on uh, how fetishism displaces solidarity and how, like what I think I see the protest as a re very much a part of recentering this kind of solidarity. Um, that has been displaced and so an attempt to rethink justice issues in a way that puts solidarity at the center of it. Um, the question Katarina had about whether the protest can be a sort of form of austerity from below. 
I don't know if I am the best person to answer that. Maybe Zoran, <laughs> he's better place to answer that question than me. But I, my uh, attempt at an answer would be that I don't think that there is an antagonism in, uh, against the public sector um, as the public sector, but definitely an antagonism against the public sector in what the public sector, sector has become in Bosnia and Herzegovina after the war. Like, I don't think that protesters might have been uh, ideologically opposed to um, you know, the public sector or spending in the public sector because many of them support the very the distributive policies. Then if you talk about policies, it's the way the public sector has been captured by ethno-nationalist elites and used it to the um, detriment of citizens that I think is really what they're, um, what they're criticizing. But I do agree that there is this sometimes the tone of some of the claims about um, also the request of um, govern technical government to replace politicians, for example, that looking at it from the outside it might seem a little bit uh, strange in this context of talking about social justice, because if we look at how governments of, techni of uh, technical experts have uh, approached social issues in other countries, there have definitely been done no you know, kind of favor to social justice anywhere, um, in, including in Italy, for example. Um, so I realize that I'm talking a lot and I would have a lot of other things to say, but maybe I should just stop talking <laughs> and see if there are other questions. But thank you again all so much. Thank you, Daniela. Um, I think that we'll start with if anyone in the audience is interested in asking a question or making a comment about the book. Uh, Enrique. Yes. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for an excellent panel. Um, hi, Daniela. Thanks for sending me the invite. Um, I, I haven't got hold of your book yet, but I am really interested um, in reading it, and this has only made me more interested to do so. Um, so I think that obviously, without having read the book, asking a question, um, uh, well, my question might might not be um, that elaborate, but um, it's a really quick and simple one that comes from someone who is also trying to be critical of, of the transitional justice literature and practice. Um, and really short and really quick, do you think that we can save the baby by throwing the bathwater out? Is there salvation for this feud? Or do, we, do you think that transitional justice is doing exactly what it came to do, which is to displace more fundamental um, claims of justice? Hmm. Should I answer now, Laura? Yeah, that's perfectly fine to do. Okay. Um, thank you. That's a kind of a million dollar question. Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, one of the problems really, as uh, Eric pointed out at the beginning, is that in some of these places, when you mention transitional justice, people really do have a very negative reaction and I wonder to what extent it, is it useful for us to continue with paradigms and labels that have been um, rejected by the very people who've been affected by violence and who would be should be at the center of these concerns of transitional justice programs so what good that comes from us fixating on keeping these alive and continuing to insist on them. And then I guess to an extent it also depends on how you want to define transitional justice because um, in part I guess uh, the problem is that transitional justice is usually seen as the institutionalized version of efforts to deal with the consequences of wartime violence or violence in authoritarian regimes. And the problems that people tend to have on the ground with these are linked to the kind of institutional efforts that are set up and the limits that they have and what they miss and what they don't address. Um, and that if we maybe, you know, then the fact that it then sidelines other aspects of justice that are not then addressed by these efforts. And I'm not sure that we are 
really able to separate anymore the term transitional justice from all of these sets of institutions. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I also don't know if we have alternatives like um, to like to the term itself uh, for now because I know there's like all of this scholarship on the concept of transformative justice, which tries to overcome the idea of justice being linked to a transition, which in itself is problematic because then again I think as I I also discussed briefly in the book when you ask people what they think about when you say transition and what they think transition means, the answers you get are not necessarily the same that uh, someone who, you know, thinks about this through uh, the paradigms of transition that we learn, I don't know, in political science or whatever. Uh, it's not the same kind of idea of transition and what it means and what it entails. Um, so, but I, but yeah, I'm not even sure whether transformative justice would um, be kind of a potential alternative to be explored, or whether you know thinking about broader forms of social justice might be a term that better captures what the claims are on the ground um, in some of these contexts. I'll take the chair's prerogative and ask one more question, uh, which is, where is this going next, Daniela? Um, that's a very good question, Laura. <laughs> um, so one of the things that, as I mentioned really briefly earlier, that I think was raised by the research and that I want to um, look at more in my in the future is the um, how socioeconomic issues. Um, so there are two things, let's say, let's explain this way. One is how socioeconomic issues have come up in other transitional justice or justice, post-war justice, more broadly defined settings in the region. So, for example, um, we, you know, while uh, in, in the case of the former Yugoslavia, definitely trials were the most significant part of transitional justice. Other attempts, such as the uh, attempt to establish this regional commission for the former Yugoslavia, um, also meant that people gathered together to discuss what should be done and how it should be done. And one of the things that I'm doing at the moment is looking at whether and to the extent to which within this recon process, socioeconomic issues came up and how they were discussed and how this forms part of a sort of political economy of transitional justice in the region. And the second thing is, which I think would be a bigger project over the coming years, um, the role of um, of corporate actors in conflict affected contexts and post-war contexts, uh, and how, again, this is linked to the political economy of conflict, but uh, so seeing the political economy of the conflict, again, not only as the context within which this kind of um, the violence takes place or crimes takes place that can be linked to the role of corporate actors, but also the way it actually structures um, or constitutes a system within which violence takes place and also the way it then ends up um, structuring the kind of responses to this violence that are uh, possible in the aftermath of conflict and all of the power relations that are in, um, embedded in, into that. Uh, so that is where I see this going. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the answer and look forward to the future research. I think that we're running out of time. So I'll kind of close the formal event by thanking both Daniela and all of the panelists for this rich discussion and hope that we can continue the conversation in different formats for a long time to come. Also thank the audience for attending and engaging.